Hello, I'm David, your host. This is Episode 2 of the Eternal Medicine Podcast Miniseries. This show is made in association with the Adventist Medical Evangelism Network, or AMEN, an organization for all medical professionals that will support you in integrating your faith into your medical field practice. Membership benefits include a subscription to the Medical Evangelist, a journal about the spiritual aspects of medical work. You can visit www.amensda.org, A-M-E-N-S-D-A dot O-R-G, to join and find more resources. In this week's episode, I will be talking with Dr. Timothy Pruitt, who is a dentist, about the ethics surrounding spiritual interactions and conversations with patients. I hope you enjoy this interview. Welcome. I'll start off by having you introduce yourself. If you could just give me your name and your education and your experience. Sure. Uh, My name is uh, Timothy Pruitt. I graduated from Southern Adventist University with a bachelor's in religion. And um, when once I graduated, I uh, transferred to Loma Linda, where I got my doctorate uh, in a dual degree program um, in dentistry and bioethics. And uh, I currently am in private practice in um, Central California, and I volunteer at a children's hospital uh, on their bioethics committee. Excellent. That sounds like a really interesting career choice. Yeah. <laughs> so in this series... Uh, We've been talking about sharing our faith in the workplace as healthcare professionals, and as Christians, we strive to care for the whole person, including the spiritual aspect. So, yes. my first question for you, is caring for the spiritual aspect of patients or clients something you learned about in dentistry school? Um, we definitely took, uh, quite a few religion classes in, in dental school. Um, but of course, you know, uh, my dental school was a faith-based, uh, institution. So, um, you would expect that from there. Um, so we did talk quite a bit about, um, caring for the patient's, uh, spiritual needs. Um, but as a dentist, it, uh, you know, it comes up a little less often than you might think, um, but maybe more often than you might think too, because you know you're with patients quite often. Um, out of out of many uh, you know healthcare professionals, dentists do see their patients quite regularly. So you know you do get to know their personal lives and their spiritual lives too. So it is something that comes up uh, from time to time. Yeah, that's true, and not something I'd really thought about before. But you probably get a chance to know your patients better over time than a lot of other health professionals. Yeah, definitely. So would you say that the spiritual aspect, is that something that um, mainstream dentistry really focuses on much? No, definitely not. No, okay. That wouldn't be something that, that uh, is focused on, on the outside world, you know, outside of uh, Christian institutions and things like that. It's, yeah, definitely not on the radar for most dentists. Okay. Well, in this podcast, we've also been talking about the ethics of sharing your faith in the workplace, and yes. given your background as an ethicist, I'm excited to dig deeper into that with you. Definitely. Um, in our discussion leading up to our current conversation, I shared an article with you that included a story that really struck out, uh, stuck out to me. Um, It included a story of a nurse in the UK who was laid off from her job because she offered to pray with a patient. Yes. And the article then delves deeply into the ethics of faith sharing in the workplace, and it makes a lot of good points, so I'm going to link it in the show notes for our listeners. But the story really stuck out to me because I've been apprehensive of something similar happening to me. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, And I think there's a general feeling of uneasiness about faith sharing in Western countries nowadays. Many countries are becoming more religiously diverse and pluralistic. Um, In my own state of Tennessee, 
There's discussion among our state leaders currently of removing the Bible from being the official state book. And, you know, as an Adventist, I tend to agree with the separation of church and state, and we don't believe the government should favor one religion over another. But there's this general trend in society, I guess, um, towards religious pluralism, and um, I think it's forcing modern Christians to change our methods of evangelism, you know, from predominantly preaching to a bigger focus on relationship ministry yes relational yeah, relational witnessing um so in the past you know it might have been easier for americans to assume that fellow americans were christian or at least grew up christian but that's not really true anymore so it's harder to reach out to other faith persons without offending them you know it's easy to yeah. witness to your co-religionists yes um but as we see this trend towards pluralism many health institutions are becoming more secular as well so i'd like to get your perspective on what seems to be an ethical dilemma mm -hmm. as a christian i'm called to tell others about this incredible joy i have in christ but you know when I work for a non-religious institution, there seems to be a, dile a dilemma there. And when I went to work for my current job, I signed a conflict of interest agreement. And yes. I want to read to you this quote from that agreement that I signed. Because the conflict of interest agreement was primarily about financial conflicts of interest. But I think it applies to other areas as well. So it said, quote, an actual potential or perceived conflict of interest occurs in those circumstances when a colleague's judgment could be affected because the colleague has a personal interest in the outcome of a decision over which the colleague has control or influence. So my big question for you is, would that relate to sharing my faith? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and I think that the answer is probably yes. Um, you know, normally, you know, as Christians, we don't really see things that way. But from an outside uh, perspective, you know, we don't look at it and say, "Oh, yeah, you know, I definitely have a a drive or a, an interest in in the outcome of this interaction with my patient." You know, it's more like, you know, what we think that we have the best interest in mind for the patient, and that. Um, the best outcome for them would be to become followers of Jesus and, and to uh, have a relationship with him. Um, but from the standpoint of um, people looking from the outside in, um, it could definitely be a conflict of interest because it is something that, um, that you have a personal stake in uh, one way or another. And um, it really brings into question the patient's autonomy and whether or not they consented and, and actually desire to to be witness to. Um, mm. So I think uh, I think it definitely uh, could be perceived as an ethical dilemma and a conflict of interest for sure. Okay. So that kind of leads me into my second question. Is there an ethical dilemma with me spending time on the clock trying to convert my patient or client especially if I'm billing insurance for my time? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good good question. And I think this really comes into to, uh, uh, to focus, especially for people who, who bill per hour, you know, when you're dealing with uh, um, counseling or, um, you know, things like that, uh, psychology and, and, and pursuits like that, where you're actually billing per hour, uh, you know, spent with the patient. Sure. Um, so that could definitely become an issue. Uh, in dentistry, uh, you know, we don't really look at things that way because we're not billing per hour. We bill per procedure. Okay. And we have a captive audience for, you know, an hour, an hour and a half at a time. And the patient has to basically sit there while we talk and, you know, discuss things with them. And they can't and they talk can't, back. <laughs> yeah, they can't really talk back. So we can talk about whatever we want to them. Uh, and we're not really billing for our time, so it, it could per be perceived that we don't have a conflict of interest there or that, uh, that, you know, 
uh, that we're not actually billing for sharing our faith. Sure. Um, but uh, it does um, does bring into into play the four principles of biomedical biomed- ethics, um, which are um, autonomy, respect for a patient's right to choose, uh, beneficence to act in the best interest of the patient. Um, non-maleficence, to do no harm or to promote good, um, more good than harm, and justice, to be fairly, to fairly distribute resources to patients. Um, and I think the one that we're really focused on here in the four principles of biomedical ethics is autonomy. Okay. Um, whether or not the patient, uh, you know, requested or, or desires to, to be shared with or to discuss, uh, religion and their, their relationship with God. And, um, and your faith. Um, so yeah, I think there, there definitely can be a, uh, a, an ethical issue, um, when it comes to, to billing your time to share your faith. But it might not be so much of a, of the time spent on, on sharing the faith, but uh, especially for hospital based, um, employees mm-hmm. or, or professionals. Um, more so uh, an ethical dilemma when it comes to the patient's uh, autonomy and right to choose. I see. Um, I think that's the, the biggest issue there. So trying to let the patient, you know, kind of dictate the direction of the time is, yes. is of utmost importance. Yes, exactly. Okay. And, okay. yeah, and, I, and, you know, but as Christians, you know, we, we feel like we have a duty um, as Christians to share our faith. And Certainly. I think that that duty is definitely, um, valid and, uh, something that, that we have to learn to balance with our careers. Um, you know, if, uh, if, if anyone went to, uh, to Southern and, and took a, a religion class by Dr. Simon, um, in the religion department, uh, there was kind of a joke going on at that time that, uh, all of Dr. Simon's classes were basically exactly the same. Um, he had like six different classes and seven different books and all of them said exactly the same thing. Uh, so you could take, you know, you could take three different classes and get, get three, three different, uh, 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 credits for the classes, but, uh, basically be tested on all the same material. (laughs) So it it was kind of fun. But one of the things that, that he drove home was, um, the Christ method for reaching people. And, um, and there was five, yeah, five, uh, five methods or five, um, uh, points that Christ used to reach people. Um, he interacted with people as one who desired their good. Uh, he sympathized with them, uh, and their needs. Uh, he strove to met their needs and, and the needs of those people around him. Uh, he won their friendship and trust, and then he invited them to follow him and have a life changing relationship with him. Um, and I, I think that, that if we employ that into our own interactions with people, I think we'll realize that, that the, that the process of winning a soul to the kingdom is much more complex than we'd like to think. You know, we like to, yeah. to skip from point A to point E, mm. where, you know, we, we interact with people and then we lead them to a knowledge and life changing relationship with Jesus. But we skip all of those in between steps of, of wow. winning their trust, um, meeting their needs, uh, and, and just mingling with people as, as just a person who wants good for them. And we huh. skip all those steps and we, we really want to get to that point where we introduce them to a life changing relationship with Jesus. And it's not always that fast, you know, it's, yeah. it's often, and we might not be the ones to actually get them to, to point E. Sure. Uh, we, we just want to get to the most exciting part, I guess. In, exactly. Yeah. We, we often strive to get to that, to that high where, you know, we felt like we had such a high, um, spiritual experience with the patient. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I think what it really comes down to is, are we, are we witnessing, um, for the best interest of the patient or are we witnessing for our own spiritual enlightenment? Um, I think that's a difficult, you know, difficult uh, question to discern sometimes. Yeah, but that's a really um, enlightening point that you're making. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it, it's hard though. It's, it's a different, difficult, uh, 
concept to, to really address sometimes. Sure. I really um, like Dr. Saman. I'm actually reading his book right now. I think it's called Christ's Method Alone. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll link it in the show notes for our listeners, but I never had the chance to take a class from Dr. Saman when I was at Southern, but I have um, had the privilege of hearing him speak, and this is his second book that I'm reading now, so he has a lot of really good stuff to say. Yeah, definitely. So another question I've had um, when it comes to ethics is what ethical problems arise when I use my position of authority or the access my job gives me to patients or clients to direct them towards my specific church. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, really difficult, especially, you know, as a, as a medical professional, you are automatically given um, respect and trust by the patient. So it definitely, you know, we, you know, it, when discussing that, that Christ method of reaching people, um, we skip to winning their confidence, which is, um, uh, you know, step four of that whole five step process. We, uh, as, as healthcare providers, we automatically skip to step number four, which is winning their trust. And, uh, we, we have their trust and their confidence going in. Um, yeah. so we are in a position of, of, of power often and oftentimes in a healthcare setting we're dealing with highly stressful highly emotional um times in the patient's life and highly emotionally charged conversations uh often and um the patient uh is receptive often so it, it could be viewed as a good time to witness but also we have to understand that the patient is highly vulnerable as well. And um, we have a duty to the patient to respect that vulnerability and to realize that, um, that we have an unfair advantage when we are discussing, uh, you know, uh, our faith with them. Sure. Um, I think that, uh, that what it really comes down to is uh, consent and autonomy um, that, you know, it's, it's one of the, there's nothing wrong with asking a patient if they are religious or if they would like to, um, to have a discussion about religion or, or faith. Um, I think so long as that, that first parameter is set that the patient is, you know, is open and yeah. desiring of that. Um, I think that we have less, much less, uh, ethical dilemmas there. Um, if we get the patient's consent and autonomy, um, or allow the patient to have autonomy in that decision. Sure. So, great points. If I'm going to share my faith in the workplace, how can I do so ethically and morally? And I think you kind of already mentioned the first step there is getting consent. Yeah. And then going <laughs> forward from there, how can I make sure that my my conversations and interactions continue to stay ethical and allow the patient to continue to have autonomy? Mm, yeah. Um, and I, I think, in, especially when you're in a hospital setting, too, um, we also can't forget our duty to refer when it comes to to uh, to certain circumstances. Uh, as, as healthcare providers, you know, sometimes we like to think that we can do it all, you know, mm. where, you know, we are, we are qualified to take the, per the patient from point A to point C. And because, you know, we are qualified to do that in, in our specific, uh, career and, and profession that we've chosen. So we sometimes jump to the conclusion that we are also qualified to take them to, from, uh, from point A to point C. Um, in our in our uh, spiritual uh, discussions as well, and that might not be the case in all circumstances. Um, you might have a duty to refer to someone who is more qualified, like a chaplain or or a pastor, or um, you know, especially if you're dealing with end end of life decisions yeah. and end of life discussions with patients that are you know that are terminal or um, 
uh, or dealing with with uh, with very difficult diseases, um, it might be a really good idea. And and you know that that chaplain might not be someone of your faith, but it is ultimately what is best for the patient because what is best for the patient at that time might not be conversion, but a a um, a solidification of their relationship with Jesus. Um, outside of your own faith, you know, it might be within their, within their faith system, you know, whether they're Baptists or Catholics or, or, um, or Islamic or, you know, uh, whatever they might, may be. Um, what is best for the patient may be to solidify their relationship with, with God, uh, within their own faith system. Wow. Um, and, uh, that's kind of a hard, hard thing to decide sometimes for us as, you know, when, when we have a desire, we, you know, we've been so uh, impacted by our faith that we wish that everyone would, was impacted by our faith in the same way. Yeah. But uh, that might not be the case for everyone, especially if you're dealing with end of life decisions and um, it might be, uh, it might not be the time for them. Yeah. That sounds like something that takes real spiritual maturity on my part as a clinician to yeah. say, you know, okay, I'm doing what's best for the patient spiritually, even though it may not be the outcome I want to see for them. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Exactly. Excellent points. So, um, one method that I've come up with for me- meeting my patient's uh, spiritual needs or addressing the spiritual aspect is sharing a booklet with any patient who expresses an interest in spiritual matters. Uh-huh. And I found this book I really like called Real Peace, Real Answers. Uh-huh. And I especially like it because it doesn't have any ads in the back for Adventist Bible studies. Uh-huh. Um, and it points people to Jesus rather than my personal church. What do yeah. you what do you think of that? I think that's I think that's an excellent option. Um yeah, I, I think uh especially when you're when you're you know like 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 we've been talking about when you're dealing with, with patients who are who are in uh those you know highly stressful situations. Yeah and especially uh, I, I since... think that like that could be yeah it could be life changing for them. And especially if they if they look through that book click it, booklet and realize that it's not an advertisement for for any specific thing that you really are just seeking their good. Yeah. Um, I think that could be life changing for sure. Excellent. Especially yeah. since I work for a non religious institution, that seems more appropriate. Yeah, definitely. What other yeah, tips really like do that. you have for sharing material in an ethical way? Um. Yeah, I think, I think ultimately it comes down to, uh, to consent. And also if you're working for, for a uh, secular, um, institution, um, that you get permission from them as well, that you're not going behind their backs and that you, you know, you acknowledge that they may not want you to be doing that. And, um, so, uh, doing, giving out literature in, in a, in a way that, uh, is transparent. And, um, and honest and, uh, and gives ultimately, uh, the patient the, the option to choose. Um, I think that is the, uh, the most ethical way of, of sharing literature, uh, with people inside of, uh, hospital settings or healthcare settings. Yeah. Excellent. Um, as if you, if you happen to own your own practice as, you know, um, most dentists do or, um, you know, some, some medical providers, um, having, uh, displayed literature, literature that people can actually take free, um, uh, at, at will, you know, yeah. um, that is also an option. Um, there, I don't see any ethical dilemma there because the patient is, uh, is choosing whether or not they want to take it. And I think ultimately, um, especially when you're, when you're in a, in a setting like a dental office where you're seeing your patients quite regularly, I think ultimately your best witness is just going to be yourself mm. and, and how you interact with your patients, uh, what kind of person you are. 
Um, I think it's going to be less in, in those exact specific, um, religious encounters you have and spiritual conversations and more in just the type of person that you display yourself to be. Um, and, and whether or not you yourself have a personal connection and relationship with Jesus in, uh, to such an extent that people can notice that, that you're different and yeah. that you care about them in a deeper way than they are usually used to. Uh, in a healthcare setting. Wow. Um, I think that is probably the most powerful witness that, uh, that we're going to have. And, um, you know, that it might sound anticlimactic because you might not get very many Bible studies or, um, baptisms that come directly from your practice. Yeah. But the life, you know, the, the, the life changing, um, uh, impact that you make on people may be profound and mm. you may see in heaven. Um, a lot more uh, people than you expected who are there because of your influence. Um, but it, you know, it's it's definitely not as uh, as uh, as uh, you know instant instantly rewarding as as we sometimes wish. Yeah, those are those are really deep truths that you're pointing out there. So let's circle back to the story I mentioned at the beginning. Is there an ethical way to ask a patient or client if you can pray with them? Mm. Yeah, you know, I, I, I did have one experience um, like this in dental school. Um, I had a, a, a patient, and actually on our, on our uh, new patient forums in dental school, um, we actually had a question uh, on, on faith and if the patient um, was, uh, was religious and if they would be willing or interested in someone talking to them about, um, about, uh, their faith. Um, so it actually made it really easy because patients can select yes or no. Um, so I happen to have a patient who had checked yes and, um, had indicated that she was very spiritual. Uh, she was not Adventist. Um, and I had to do, um, uh, several extractions on her for one day and she was extremely nervous, very scared. Yeah. And because I had that information on hand and I knew that she was religious and that she would appreciate it. Um, I asked her if she would be, if she uh, would like me to pray with her before her, her um, procedure, cause she was very nervous and um, her blood pressure was elevated and she was just, you know, very scared. And uh, so I offered to pray with her and, uh, she agreed, and uh, and so I, we prayed with her right there in clinic. And uh, a a younger student was assisting me with that day, and um, he thought it was very awkward because I don't think he was amateur or anything. <laughs> so it was uh, it was kind of an interesting uh, experience for for everyone in the room. But the patient uh, was very appreciative, and she calmed down. We were able to do the extractions. Wow. Um, so I think I think ultimately it it comes down to that uh, to that how much do you know about the patient. Okay. And, and, uh, do you know that they would, that would be something that would actually be comforting to them? Yeah. Uh, for some patients, it, it may actually be distressing for you to, to, to ask that question or, uh, you know, it, it might be, uh, might be alarming to them. I so can see it really that. depends on the, on the patient and, and what they've indicated to you and how much of a relationship you already have with that patient. Uh, whether it's been a relationship that you've developed over time or if you just met this patient and just had an emotionally challenging conversation uh, and you may feel like you're ready to, to, you know, to go that next step in your relationship and pray with them, but they might not feel the same way. And um, I think it's really important to be uh, a, you know, uh, as as wise as a serpent as an, and as harmless as, as a dove, as they would say, you know, yeah. to to really uh, evaluate your your relationship with the patient and how much you actually know uh, about them and whether or not they would actually appreciate that. So it seems like uh, interpersonal skills and being able to assess, you know, where your patient's at emotionally and spiritually is a really good skill set to develop. Yeah, in yeah, definitely. To this. And, it's, and it's definitely not a, a skill set that everyone is going to have right off the bat, you know. Right. Um, I think uh, you'll make blunders along the way, but yeah. um, I think if you if you uh, if you approach the subject with sincerity and a desire to do what's best for the patient, 
yeah. and a desire to, to honor the patient's uh, rights and um, ability to, to choose, uh, I think you will be on the road to, to success and, and uh, really impacting your, the life and, and spiritual experience of your patients. So it sounds like a lot of your points really come back to the ethical principle of autonomy you mentioned towards the beginning. Yes. Because yeah. We have to remember that our patients are independent agents with free will. God gives us the right to reject him. And so we have to honor the fact that our patients or clients may not want anything to do with God or even hear about him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, yeah, I, go ahead. No, I, I was saying, I, I believe that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. So, what are some methods that dentists in particular could use to meet the spiritual needs of their clients? Anything you want to add alongside what you've already shared? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, just recapping uh, what I briefly mentioned before, uh, actually having that in your new patient forums uh, where you, you request um, whether the patient is interested in, in religion or has a desire um, to, uh, to explore uh, religion or talk about it. Um, I think that's a, a great start for any, any uh, private office anyway. Yeah. Um, and having liter uh, literature in the in the waiting room um, that patients can take of their own free will, uh, I think that's another great option. Uh, but you know, for a lot of young dentists, they're not in private practice and they're you know working for a uh, a corporate uh, office or something like that. Um, ultimately, I think it's just uh, getting to know your patients very well and having those conversations with them. Uh, which can be challenging sometimes, um, especially in a corporate setting because you're, you're pushed, uh, pretty hard to, uh, to produce. So you might not have a whole lot of time with your patients. Right. So when it, when it comes to, um, to getting to know your patients, it might be rather difficult and you may never get to that point where you actually, uh, the patient feels comfortable with you enough to discuss their religious, uh, beliefs or practices. Um, sure. So ultimately, it may come down to just how you interact with that patient and uh, your own personal witness and your and your relationship with them and uh, the way that you treat them and, and the way that you treat your staff and, and those around you. Great advice. And especially getting to know your patients and and remembering details about them from one visit to another. Yeah. Maybe uh -huh. even to the point that you keep a couple notes on them so you can remember. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's definitely a, a good life hack to, um, to write down what you talked about at your last visit, uh, huh. in your, in your treatment note, um, so that you, you can pull it up and you, you remember what you talked about at your last visit. Yeah. Um, definitely builds rapport with patients for sure. Cause I know I only see my dentist right. once every six months and I know they see yeah. a lot of patients in between there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your experience and for all this great advice. I think it's been a very enlightening discussion. Yeah, it's great. I was, it's an honor to, to join your podcast here and discuss this. I'm uh, very, very honored. Thank you. Hey, it's David again. If you enjoyed this episode please share it with someone who might also enjoy it. Be sure to subscribe so you will be notified of future episodes. Also, see the show notes for more resources. Next episode, I will sit down and talk with two nurses. Thanks for listening, and remember to keep serving, keep healing, keep praying.